thank you for listening and making time for yeah, attending this webinar. It's the first time that I'm only speaking to women, but I, I don't see them, unfortunately, but uh, I hope uh, you are there and you stay there and we will, and uh, I hope you will enjoy this uh, presentation. So um, it's indeed about anomaly detection for multivariate and high dimensional data. I have been working on that yeah, since my PhD. So that's already many years that I'm working on that topic. And so I decided to give kind of overview of different methods that we have developed in our research group. So I start with a table of contents, obviously. Now, often a table of contents is more like a list. Uh, uh, first I do that and then that and that. So I thought, let me show you a real table of contents. And then here it is. So what I... We'll cover today, you see quite some uh, acronyms, quite some different methods, but don't worry, I will not uh, detail them all very much. It's mostly that I want to give you kind of an idea, main properties or some methods, I will only show you one example. Now, if we look uh, to the left of that table, you see that we will discuss two types of outliers, so-called row-wise, case-wise outliers versus cell-wise outliers. That will be the end of my talk. Uh, and that will be a very short part since you see that I tried to cover many different topics. Most of the work so far has been done on row-wise outliers. Also, my own research is mostly concerned with that. But um, I'll explain on the next slide what the difference is. So a little bit, I will talk about the cell-wise as well. And then within the row-wise, I will discuss different types of distributions. What if data are elliptical, or at least the majority of the data points come from an elliptical distribution? What if they come from a skewed or a non-elliptical distribution? And then so we cover settings where data are multivariate or high dimensional. And yeah, that's mostly whether P is larger or smaller than N. So let's first focus on the difference between row-wise and cell-wise outliers. If we talk about outliers, what we typically do is to say, oh, observation, for example, five or 10 from my data set is an outlier. So what you then do is, if this is your data matrix, you essentially indicate some of the rows to be contaminated. Uh, you, you assume, that's what the row-wise contamination model says, you assume that some of the rows have been replaced by some arbitrary row, rows. And you try to find them, to flag them, without really being able to indicate why they are outlined. So the result of a row-wise robust method is typically that you have robust estimates or yeah, depending on, on your model uh, or your coefficients or param parameters of the model, but also that you flag a whole observation as an outlying point or not. Yeah, also, yeah, as usual, we indicate the number of observations by n and the number of variables by p. So our assumption is that there can be in our data sets, such outlying rows. And yeah, typically that are then cases that come from a different population, or there can be yeah, bad recordings or what's Already since the 60s of previous century, many estimators have been um, developed. Uh, I also worked on that uh, for covariance, regression, PCA, and for, for many other models. And they were all devised for that situation with row-wise outliers. You see, you're also coming in the word equivariant. I will say more about that on the next slide. Uh, equivariance, yeah, the, the, the fact that you require equivariancy of your estimators also leads to certain types of estimators. Now, what is the idea, the general philosophy behind robust statistical methods? Although we, we want finally to flag the outliers, to find the outliers, we do that by 
searching for the majority. Because what is an outlier? An outlier is something that deviates from the majority. So that's our first goal, to try to find that. And once you have found that robust fit, you can then say, oh, an outlier is, or an anomaly is a case that deviates from that robust fit. And yeah, depending on the model and the method, uh, the, those methods typically will downweight outlying rows or they will even remove them completely. I will give you examples, of course, later on. What they all require is that you have at least a majority of non-contaminated uh, rows so that you have at least half of the rows that are clean, that form that majority. What is also important in the whole methodology is that we do not know what the proportion of outliers is. That would make uh, the problem much easier. So we assume that we do not know that whether we have one outlier or 10 outliers or 20 in our data set. But what we typically assume is that we, uh, yeah, we, we have an idea about the upper bound. Well, if you have no idea, you have to set it to 50%. But if you're more confident in your data, you can, for example, also from the beginning say, well, I assume that I have at most 25% of outliers, and this can then yield more efficient methods. So what do we mean with that equivariancy? Um, well, you can transform your data. You can, for example, just shift your data by a certain constant B. So Xn here is my n times p dimensional data matrix. And we can add a constant value to all of these data points. And then, of course, you want, if you estimate location, that applying your location estimate on the transformed data should be the same as computing your center on the original data and then adding that constant factor. That's location equivariancy. That's of course, satisfied for the mean, for the median, and for most location estimators. And there are similar definitions when you want to perform uh, scale transformations, uh, when you apply rotations to your data, or when you apply defined transformations to them. And then you want the estimators to transform accordingly, uh, like what happens with the empirical average and the empirical covariance matrix. But we can also require from other estimators that they satisfy certain equivariance properties. For some settings or some estimators and models, you require an estimator to be invariant to certain uh, transformations. For example, scale invariancy can sometimes be yeah, interesting that you can rescale your data without having an effect on your estimate. And the same, of course, for the other kinds of transformations. So that, that will come back here and there, uh, these types of equivariance and invariance properties. Another topic or concept that is important in the context of robust estimation is breakdown value or breakdown points. And here you see a long sentence, but it's essentially it tells us how many outliers your method can resist. If you just think about univariate median, well, the median can resist up to 50% outliers. What does that mean? Well, if you have more than 50% outliers in your data set, then your estimate can be anything. Uh, the further away you, you would uh, put your outliers, the, the further away also your median would, um, would go. Whereas if you have less than 50% outliers, then your estimate uh, will still be bounded. It, it will change a bit. It's not that it's completely insensitive to, to the outliers, but at least it will stay in a fixed bounded set. So that concept of breakdown value is important to compare different robust estimators. And it has been shown that for 
fine equivariant estimators, like in a location for scatter for regression, that they have a breakdown value that is at most 50%, which is quite logical. It essentially says that otherwise your estimator could not make the distinction between good observations and outliers. Here you see some examples. I will be short about that, but we obviously know that classical mean and covariance matrix, that they are absolutely not resistant to outliers. So their breakdown value is zero, but they are a fine equivariant. The Malanobis distance, which is an important uh, concept in multivariate statistic, that's an affine invariant measure. That's also why it's so interesting to study. You can apply affine transformations to your data, and this will not affect the Malanobis distance. Euclidean distance, on the other hand, is um, only location and orthogonal uh, invariant. Now you can rotate your data, but you cannot start to stretch the data. Just to give a final example, if we think about the coordinate-wise median, that's a very robust estimator with maximum breakdown value of 50%, but it's not orthogonal or a fine equivariant. If you rotate the data, this yeah, affects coordinate-wise all observations, and it's yeah, it will give you different results than rotating the median you have um, computed on your original data. So for um, multivariate data, we cannot just say, oh, we use the coordinate-wise median to have a high breakdown estimator. Well, you can do that, but then you don't have an equivariant one. If you want to combine both, that's more difficult, and uh, that's why other methods have been uh, defined and studied. Before we go to that, let me also explain the cell-wise outliers. So the idea of the cell-wise contamination model is that not certain rows have been replaced by arbitrary values, but some of the cells. So you really look at the individual cells of the table. And here it's visualized that, for example, each of these black um, cells are, in this case, um, represent outlying cells. Now, you can see from this figure already that if this is happening randomly, that your cells are um, outlying in the whole table, in the end, you might end up with a matrix that has less than 50% uncontaminated rows. Or even every row could become contaminated somewhere. So if this is the setting, if this is how your data look like, then a robust, a row-wise robust method will not work appropriately. So it's also important to develop methods for that setting. And Many people are working nowadays on developing cell-wise robust methods. And one of the things they, they try to avoid is to downweight or to remove the complete row where some outliers are. Because yeah, maybe you then have to drop all, all rows or almost all rows. And then of course, there's a high loss of efficiency. Equivariancy is here less relevant and only location and scale equivariance is relevant because rotating your data yeah, changes your coordinate system and, and then what a cell is has another interpretation uh, with respect to the original data. So that's a bit the setting. This is what I explained now that we have here the row-wise and cell-wise um, contamination. But we will now go to the row-wise setting and look at a method that we can apply when the majority of our data comes from an elliptical distribution. So we typically have the multivariate normal distribution in mind. First, we look at the multivariate setting and then we go to the bidimensional. The estimator I want to discuss with you is the MCD or the minimum covariance determinant estimator. So we have a multivariate 
data set, we want to estimate the center, mu, and the shape of that data set. And as I just said, we assume in this setting that the majority of the data comes from a distribution with elliptical density contours. How is the MCD defined? Well, in fact, it's defined in two steps, and the most important one is the first one. The raw MCD says, well, that estimator tries to find the majority, so that means an outlier free subset of H observations. And those observations should have the tolerance ellipsoid with minimal volume. This value H is fixed in advance. The N minus H should be the upper bound of the number of outliers you expect in your data, or otherwise said, H is a lower bound for the number of regular observations that you assume in your data. So first, you search for an outlier-free subset, certain size, and then you compute the mean and the covariance matrix of those observations that are not flagged as an outlier by this initial raw estimate. This is then what we call the reweighted MCD. Now, software is always immediately computing the reweighted MCD. So if people talk about MCD, it's typically the reweighted one. Okay, let me give you a bit more details. If you want to, and I go back to the previous slide, if you want a tolerance ellipsoid that has minimal volume, well, the tolerance ellipsoid is proportional to the determinant of, your, of the covariance matrix of those data points. So alternatively, that's where the name MCD comes from, uh, we search for those H observations such that the determinant of their covariance matrix is minimal. And if we have found that subset, we take the mean of those observations as a location estimate and their scatter matrix then, or the covariance matrix of, those, of that subset corresponds then with our scatter matrix estimate. Though we still need to multiply by consistency factor, for example, to obtain consistency at the normal level. This estimator needs more observations than variables. In fact, needs uh, twice as much, or n should be larger than two times p, because otherwise, if you don't have enough observations, then the sample covariance matrix will always have a zero determinant, and then obviously you cannot minimize it than zero for any subset you would consider. Now, in practice, though, and this is not just for robust statistics, it's also in classical statistics, we, yeah, the more observations you have with respect to the dimension, the better. And since even the robust estimators use less observations, they, they build estimates initially based on maybe only half of your observations, it's better to have yeah, as a kind of uh, rule, at least uh, five times p uh, observation. You will have the optimal robustness when you select a small value, when you choose a small value for h. So yeah, you can define it precisely to have optimal breakdown value, but roughly it says where h is half of your data size. Uh, but then, if you think about this raw MCD, this implies that you only compute the mean and the covariance matrix based on half of your data. So that's not really a lot. And then your estimates are not so accurate, or they can be, well, it depends on the value of n, of course, but for regular data sizes, you lose efficiency by using a uh, small value for each. Now, one solution already to obtain more efficient estimates is then to apply this uh, reweighting step. That means we first compute the robust distance. So the distance of every 
of the original observations to the current mean and with respect to the current scatter estimate. Uh, it's a Malanobis distance, but we call it a robust distance because we don't use the empirical average and covariance matrix here. And then based on these distances, we say, well, robust distances or these squared robust distances, they have typically a approximately a chi-square distribution with p degrees of freedom when your data are sampled from a normal distribution. So we can use a certain cutoff value, and here we take the 70, the yeah, no, yeah, 79 and a half quantile of the chi-square distribution. And we say, okay, observations that have a too large robust distance. Um, that are potential outliers, and we give them here weight zero. But you could also use a more redescending kind of type of weight, but the weight defined by Peter Rousseau when he defined the MCD is by using a heart rejection um, weight function. And so all the observations that have a sufficiently small robust distance get full weight one, and then we compute the mean and the covariance matrix of those observations. This is in particular interesting if you have chosen H to be, for example, the n over two, that smallest value, whereas in your data set, you only have like 5% of outliers, but you didn't know that. And then you took a very robust approach then you obtained estimates only based on half of your data uh, sets, which is not very accurate. With this reweighting step, you can include much more of the regular observations in your final estimates. And so based on the final estimates, we then recompute robust distances and we flag our multivariate observations as outliers if they exceed that cutoff. Well, I, I already mentioned that the value of H, uh, well, determines the breakdown value, how robust your estimator is, how resistant to outliers. And so the default values are either considering H over N to be a half or H over N to be three fourths. This is an, a fine equivariant estimator. So you can apply rotations to your data, rescale them, apply any fine transformation, and then your estimates transform nicely with it. Now here you see a very easy two-dimensional example. It's about uh, Italian wines and two yeah, characteristics of the wines are studied, the proline and malic acids apparently. Now, if you plot, the data you look at the scatter plot, you clearly see majority of points over here and then some outliers. If we compute the classical covariance matrix and we draw the corresponding tolerance ellipse, we get this huge ellipse that tries to yeah, obtain small Malanobis distances for all the observations, whereas the MCD yields this ellipse, which is much smaller, has a much smaller volume, and it really only encloses the regular points. Of course, you cannot always draw such a figure. This can only be done for bivariate data. But here we see a plot of the robust distances, for example, where then you can clearly yeah, see which of them have an outlying distance. So that's the MCT shortly explained. Then there is, of course, also the computation of the estimator. And, and this is far from easy. Uh, remember the main goal, the row MCD, was to find an outlier free subset of a size that is typically at least n over 2. To find the one that yields a minimum determinant yeah, would require you to look at all the subsets to compute for each of them the covariance matrix and its determinant, and then to select the one with minimal term. And that's, of course, not feasible to do if n is large and also h is large. So, fortunately, a 
foster algorithm has been developed by Peter Lucero and Katrien Andriessen. And what is essential in that algorithm is the so-called C-step. And I will first explain this, the C-step, before I explain the other parts of the algorithm. The idea of the C-step is as follows. Assume we have a certain subset, a subset of size H. And we have computed the mean and the covariance matrix, as we have to do in the MCD. So we have a certain subset, we compute mean covariance matrix, and then based on those estimates, we can compute the robust distances of all the N observations. So not just of the age we used for that subset, but for all N observations. We compute these, we rank the robust distances, and then we consider the age observations that have the smallest robust distance. We can compute their mean and covariance matrix. And then it turns out that the covariance matrix of this new H subset always has a lower covariance determinant than the previous subset. So, or it can be the same determinant as well, then, then we are stuck in a local minimum. So these quite easy steps just generate a sequence of H subsets that always yield a lower covariance determinant. So what are the other components, let's say then, of the algorithm? is that you need some initial H subset. And you could say, okay, that's easy. I, I just randomly draw uh, N over two observations from my data set. But then there is still a large probability that at least one of these observations contain an outlier. So the algorithm only selects the smallest number of observations, the smallest number that you need to have a non-zero covariance determinant, and that's P plus one. And from these P plus one that are randomly drawn, you can compute the mean and covariance matrix. And then we have a first estimate. And we can compute robust distances based on this, yeah, very inaccurate uh, estimate in the beginning, but immediately afterwards, we obtain a subset of size H, and then we can apply several C steps. And in theory, you could apply C steps yeah, until the end, until convergence. But still then, you have to do that many times, starting with many random subsets of this very small size P plus one. What the algorithm does is not to apply all the C steps until convergence, but only applies two C steps, because with two C steps, you can already classify, let's say, the subsets that have a very small and a rather large uh, covariance determinant. So you only consider the subsets with the smallest covariance determinant, the 10 ones with the smallest covariance determinant of the two C steps. And it's only onto these that you apply C steps until convergence. So that are certain tricks, so to say, that um, reduce the computing time you don't need to do the computations or the full computations on all subsets. And so this is a very clever algorithm and it has been applied in, in many other settings as well where people have generalized the idea of the C-steps also in other methods and other algorithms. Work I've done in this setting uh, is to improve the computing time, and also to make sure that you have an algorithm which is permutation invariant, which doesn't have a random component. That's a so-called that MCD algorithm. It's already published 10 years ago. Well, the idea there is to start with subsets that are often already quite robust, so you start with initial ones, and then you apply C steps to them. And these, in, in our case, we, we came up with six deterministic subsets 
they were constructed in a way that they are easy to compute, that they don't yield too much computing time. Either they were easy, uh, robust estimators of multivariate location scatter, or we first robustly transform two variables. And one of the transformation is just using the rank of them, transforming them by their rank, and then to compute their correlation, which comes down to using the Spearman correlation matrix, for example. And this yielded an imbecile to algorithm, which is much, much faster than fast MCT. Uh, but of course, it, certainly in, in moderate dimensions, eh, but we are still in this multivariate setting, which is completely invariant. But of course, there's a price to pay. And the price here is that the algorithm itself is no longer fully equivariant. And this has become some of our initial estimators uh, are not fully a fine equivariant. And yet that's also the reason why they're easier to compute. If you release that assumption of equivariancy, you can find much easier estimators to compute. And then yet another improvement, more recent improvement of the that MCT algorithm is then a faster one where we only need two deterministic subsets instead of the six. And these were based on more recent work. So we could come up with uh, yeah, even robuster initial subsets, uh, but also to combine that with parallel computing. And by doing computations oh yeah, on only part of the data and then by aggregating everything in a robust way. And that yields a algorithm that can be computed or where the computations can be done in real time. Now I skipped the, the example here. I just want to show you here what, what's a bit, how the algorithm works. So we split the data in several partitions. And then for every partition, we compute two initial subsets. We apply C steps then obtain row estimates, row MCD estimates for each partition, and then we combine it. But I leave the details for what they are, otherwise I cannot go uh, through the other. Methods. This was for multivariate data. What about high dimensional? I'm first going to drink a bit. What now if we have high dimensional data? As I said, we can no longer compute the MCD if uh, the size of the subset would be smaller than P. Well, both in the classical and robust setting, then a solution is um, proposed to regularize your covariance determinant, your covariance matrix. And the minimum regularized covariance determinant estimator minimizes the determinant of a combination, convex combination of the covariance matrix of an H subset, as, as before, but also using a positive definite target matrix. And by doing that, you always end up with a with an estimate that is a, a fine definite. Again, I will not go through all the details, but for example, also in the algorithm that been proposed by the others, it's um, yeah, that regularization constant rho is chosen such that the condition, condition number of your resulting covariance matrix is at most 50. So that's also to guarantee that you don't have very degenerated or um, settings or with very small eigenvalues. And it turns out that that C-step idea can also be extended within this framework. And this allowed the others also to develop an algorithm which is similar to the that MCD algorithm. So you have deterministic starts and then you iterate them using uh, C steps well adapted to this estimator, of course. So here's an example of the octane data sets, data set we often use in, uh, in our papers to illustrate the robustness of certain methods. These are high dimensional data, absorbance spectra of um, samples where n is 39 and p is 226. 
you see the data shown here, the spectra, and, and obviously these six ones here are very outlined, mainly here at the larger wavelengths. And it's known why, because apparently they contain some added alcohol. Well, if you compute the MRCT and then look at the resulting robust distances, you get this figure here. It's an index plot of these distances and the outline is clearly stick. So um, here they are clearly found or flecked, which that's a robust approach. The MCD, as I said, is in a fine equivalent estimator with maximal breakdown value. And it was one of the first ones, but the very first defined equivariant estimator it was defined was or is the so-called Stahel Donohoe estimator, because both Stahel and Donohoe proposed that estimator almost simultaneously. And the idea of the Stahel Donohoe estimator is is different from that more multivariate approach that we have used in uh, for the MCD. In other words, so it's based on a covariance matrix. Stahl-Dono is based on the projection pursuit principle. If a case is a multivariate outlier, then it should be outlying at least one direction. So what is done? For each observation in your data set, the outlyingness is computed. Well, you can also compute that for any other point. It shouldn't, this shouldn't be a data point, just a p-dimensional observation its outlyingness relative to the given data set with n observations is given by this expression. And what does it mean? Well, we project the data on many directions. So A is the direction on which we project our data. Then we get just data on a line, univariate data. So we can compute a robust center, the median, and a robust scale, the median absolute deviation of the um, yeah, of these uh, projected observations. And then you see, you essentially compute something like a z-score or an absolute z-score for that observation. And then you do that over all possible directions and you take the supreme. So the worst outlyingness that you find by projecting them on all possible directions. That's the stahel dono outlyingness. You can compute that for all your observations or n observations. And then the stahel dono estimator will give weights to each of these um, cases, weights depending on the outlyingness, where obviously the larger the outlying is, the smaller the weight will become. And then again, a bit similar to the reweighted MCD, you then take a weighted mean and covariance matrix of your observations. So that's another approach to obtain a high breakdown and a fine equivariant estimator of location and scale. Here in this projection pursuit approach, and this also holds for other methods based on projection pursuit, the issue of course is a computation because we cannot consider all directions. So you have to restrict yourself to a finite set. Well, one possible approach is to do that. With subsampling, uh, you take a direction. So you take a random subset uh, of, of size uh, n over two, and then you take, you compute a hyperplane spent by that uh, subset, and you take the direction orthogonal to that. That's an affine equivariant approach, but of course it also takes some time because you have to compute all those hyperplanes and you have to repeat that also many times. The best PCA method that we have proposed yet already 15 years ago now combines a bit the ideas of the MCD and the style to know outline. So that it is for high dimensional data again. The style to know can also be computed for high dimensional data. That's the advantage of using a projection pursuit method that you can compute on high dimensional data because you, you just project them on a line. So we start by computing the style donor outlineness of all the observations. 
Would we do that? Not in an affine equivariant way, uh, it would not be possible here, but in a orthogonal equivariant way. And this is sufficient in the context of PCA, because that's what we are trying to do now to build a robust PCA map. So we take just directions through two data points that are randomly drawn from the data, and we take the maximum outlyingness over all these directions. And then we take the H observations that have the smallest outline. So they are least outlined, so to say. That should be an outlier free data set. Now, if the algorithm worked well, um, then we have an outlier free data set. So we can apply classical PCA to that subset of data. This implies that we reduce the dimension to K, that we project them on the subspace spent by the largest eigenvalues of the covariance matrix of that subset. And then typically the number of um, components of PCA components is much smaller than N. So we turn ourselves into a multivariate setting and we can then compute the mean and covariance matrix of the so-called scores that are the data and projected data within that subspace. And we do that by means of the MCD. So that's the, the global idea of um, our robust PCA method. And of course, I'd like to illustrate that on a data set. And what we do, we do not only um, try to propose robust methods, we also try to, we try to propose diagnostic tools uh, visualizations of the outliers. Now here, this is visualized in the setting of PCA where we try to find a subspace. You can uh, define two types of outlyingness with respect to your estimated subspace. So the regular, all the observations that are the fully, the, the dots, the bullets here, the open circles here that are the projected data, that are the scores within the subspace. You can then have observations like yeah, the, the observation one here that is outlying with respect to, this, to the subspace, but once it is projected, it's no longer outlying within our group of regular observations. So only the orthogonal distance is large. But then there are observations like two and three that are far from your subspace. They have a large orthogonal distance. And moreover, they are far from the regular observations within the subspace. So there, if we compute the robust distance within the subspace, that distance will also be large. And that is what we call the score distance. And we can compute it as the robust distance based on our MCD estimate within the subspace. Observations four and five are only outlined with respect to the score distance, not with respect to their orthogonal distance. And that's what we call good leverage points. Two and three are the worst ones. If you have that type of outliers in your data, they are the worst ones because they can, classical PCA will be highly influenced by them and, and will PCA, classical PCA plane will be tilted towards these observations. Uh, and so I go to the PCA outlier map that then plots the orthogonal distances versus the score distance. And it then allows us to classify, visualize the different outliers um, and, and to classify them in two different types. There are two cutoff lines here. The, for the score distance, we can use a chi-square based cutoff value. As we typically assume that the scores are normally distributed. For the orthogonal distance, there's also a result that we can use that a certain power transformation of these orthogonal distances is approximately normally distributed. So let's apply this to our octane data. There it turns out that two components are sufficiently enough to well represent our data. And we get on this outlier map when we apply ROP PCA to it. And, and then you clearly see that the outlying spectra also have a much larger orthogonal and a much larger score distance than the regular observations. 
And here's another example uh, that's the glass data set. It's another high dimensional data set, energy levels. And we have 70, 750 variables and 39 observations, glass samples. Uh, and you see that some of them here are colored differently. They're already uh, medium centered. Uh, that are observations that are known to be actual for many different reasons. I, I skip the details. Let us just look at the result of applying rub PCA to it. And then these colored observations, these known outliers, indeed, mostly all of them show up again as being outlying in one or more both distances. Classical PCA, on the other hand, yeah, it shows us only that, that few of the green cases are outlying, but none of the others. Well, I'm afraid I have prepared really too much. <laughs> I'm always also speaking too much. So what I want to do is to completely jump to the last part, because that's then about the cell-wise outliers, so that you can see the difference a bit, and to the macro TDC and micro PCA methods. I don't know whether slides will become uh, available, or you can always ask me if you want to have my slides for the other methods. So, cell wise methods uh, are they will try to flag cells in the matrix and the detect deviating uh, cells uh, method that has been proposed by Peter uh, Lucero and one of van den Bosse, yeah, they allow to do that. It's a method that is, can be used for multivariate and high dimensional methods. And the result will be that if this is your data matrix with your observed values, it will, it will flag for each cell, whether it's regular, then it's yellow colored, whether it's unusually large, then it gets a red value, or whether it's unusually small, then it's colored blue or purple, well, there's even a gradation of the different colors that is used within the algorithm. And we applied this um, DDC algorithm in combination with an adapted version of ROPCA to come up with micro PCA methods, which is a uh, method that can detect both row-wise, cell-wise outliers and can cope with missing values. And applied to the class data, we then get this outlier map. But, and this is a more detailed, um, yeah, what we call residual map, uh, where again, each cell of the data matrix is colored according to its outliers. But it's more than time to stop here. So I provide you also the website where you can find all the papers and um, also mention some of the R packages that implement, or, or where you can find an implementation of R. So thank you very much for um, staying with us, <laughs> staying with me. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer.